Broadcasting live throughout Utah Valley, Sevier Valley, Central Utah, Castle Valley, the Uinta Basin, and the world. It's Mike and Heather in the morning with their good friend in all his bearded glory, Pastor Matthew Anderson of Utah Valley Church in Spanish Fork, Utah. Hey, good morning. <laughs> yes, 9 o'clock, and it is Mike and Heather. and we, Pastor Matthew Anderson, the, the bearded one. And the conversation always goes to beards when you come in here, does it not? It's You guys have a strange infatuation with the beard. We just love you, man. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> we just we um, admire you. It's glorious. It really is. We have, we have Grant in here. Grant has the beard. Mike, you have a beard. I am the only one who is beardless. I, I'm transitioning as as you right know. now. I had, I had the goatee <laughs> thing going, uh-huh. and now I'm growing into a, a full beard. It's beautiful. Yeah, yeah, just in time for summer. Thing. But I had to trim this down to kind of <laughs> yeah, make the transition. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we might as well just talk about just it. Just in time for summer, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a good summer beard. Yeah, we might as well talk about it, about that study. About the, I, I know that this is kind of a, a, a sore subject for you, Pastor Matthew. You know what? My wife and I were talking about this very thing this morning. Were you now? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's kind of disturbing. I mean, it's all over social media. Um, Switzerland's... Hearst Landing Clinic wanted to find out if there was a risk that humans might pick up a dog-borne disease from an MRI scanner uh, that would uh, was also used uh, by veterinarians for exam. So, okay, so we use this MRI scanner for dogs, and now we're going to use the same scanner for humans. Are humans going to contract some sort of weird dog disease? <laughs> okay, that was... Or vice versa, right? Uh, well, that, that was the question. <laughs> you know, you have to worry about these things. So they swabbed samples of whiskers from 18 guys and 30 dogs, and the professors discovered that all the bearded men showed high microbial counts, but only 23 out of the 30 dogs had high counts. Plus... Seven of the guys sampled were found to harbor microbes that posed an actual threat to human health. Isn't that interesting? A couple of things. Number one, I'm looking at this and I'm looking at the number of samples, right? You got 30 guys and you have, or no, 18 guys and 30 dogs. Well, if you go to like a a high school or a middle school science fair, usually their samples are a little bit bigger than that. (laughs) You know, like uh, you you have to have more than so many samples in order to come up with a a conclusion for the hypothesis that you have presented to us. So right off there, I'm like, "Mm, okay, maybe the sample. We don't know. It's not exactly scientific. What part of the dog are they plucking this thing from? (laughs) It must be the head, the top of the head. I don't have a clue. I think it was a neck. (laughs) Might be the neck, who knows? But they're saying that dogs can be considered as clean compared with bearded men. You have a beautiful beard. What do you think about this, Pastor Matt? Don't even get me started. I'm going to get you started. This is, I'm <laughs> yeah, they're, excited. They're, you I'm, don't have to I'm, I'm, work them up like that. <laughs> I want She's to. trying to get me fired up. <laughs> Come on, yeah. poking buttons. Grant's not the only one who pushes buttons around I'm here. Out of the cages. <laughs> well, I th- think about this. Okay, so here's, here's a couple of theories I have. So, um, so women have hair on their head. Yes, we do. So what difference does it make whether it's on the front or the back? Just what? the amount of food that lands in it. Okay. <laughs> so, so you wash your hair every day, mm-hmm. shampooed, I'm assuming, or most days. My beard gets washed, shampooed, and conditioned every single day. Right? Mm-hmm. So, so if there's any like harmful microbes that are going to find their way into my beard, mm-hmm. if my beard wasn't there, right? Assuming my beard wasn't there, where are those microbes going to go? Well, they would float off into the air, and your they chin. would not They're, touch They'd anything. likely your stick shirt. to my skin or my <laughs> shirt, right? Yeah. So I'm protecting my skin and my shirt from harmful microbes mm. at very, and, and at very least. So, yeah. so what you're saying is that if you don't have a beard, beard it's going to go healthier. straight to your skin. It's healthier to have a beard than it is to not have a beard. Is that what you're saying? Well, I think that's what you're saying, and I would agree with you. <laughs> 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 awesome. Awesome. I yeah, and I think that's exactly it. I don't know the test subjects. I don't know where they're getting the peoples from. I don't even know. Maybe they're the dogs were groomed every day and the people weren't. Who knows? I mean, there's nothing to, to show that. But I think that the moral of the story is, you know, grow your beard, be happy with like you say well, all the time, embrace the face. Embrace the face. But Amen. just wash it. <laughs> just wash your face, wash your beard, and then you don't have to worry about harmful mm-hmm. microbes and, you know health threats to the yeah, society. I don't, I don't think it matters anyway. What do you mean? It, I mean, yes, we should be clean, but I mean, really, there's a lot of <laughs> healthy, less than washing their beard every day people in, in the world as right. well. Okay. So, so I coined a phrase a while back. Somebody would look at me and say, well, nice beard, but I prefer to clean, be clean shaven. 
Mm -hmm. And I say, well, I prefer to be clean bearded. Oh, that's nice. And that's really, that's that's what we're going to hover on, being right. clean bearded today. <laughs> I think all the biblical characters probably had beards, right? It was shameful not to have a beard. Yeah. Oh, so it's biblical. <laughs> it still is, right? <laughs> Oh, moving on. Moving on. Yes, looking at Fox News, the headline reads, Human brains could be connected to the Internet in the next few decades, scientists predict. Are we ready for that? Well, I it's I the next step. Are. I mean, we're all sitting there. How, how many times we're do you consult connected. it? Yeah, <laughs> 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 really. We just put fingers in between our, our thumbs. Yeah. Mm, yeah. <laughs> so I think we're, we're pretty much already there. It's just a matter of time. <laughs> oh, should I be scared about that? Well, I don't know. Okay. We could be. All right. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Next few decades, I don't know if we'll be around so much, but <laughs> okay. I have to share this because this is really funny too. There was this woman from France, and they had this Paris marathon, and she finished the marathon in six hours and four minutes or so, right? Which I think is fantastic. That's that's really clipping along. Um, some people though, they finish it quicker than that, oh, like yeah. by two hours, right? But mm -hmm. here's the deal: she ran it in high heels. Oh, yeah, yeah isn't that funny? That's different. Yeah. Apparently, um, one day her friend. And she were like in, like it was raining and she had to dart to her car and she must have been from work or something. So she ran to her car, lickety split in her heels and her friend's like, hey, you could run a marathon. And she's like, I bet you I could. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine. I bet Mike could run a marathon in heels. <laughs> I, no. I want to see that. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't think so. Come on, man. I had a bad dream that I had to run with, uh, with flip flops on. Last night, I was dreaming about that. That's like horrible. Like trying to escape a bear with flip flops on, you know, like you're working so hard to keep those things from falling off and the bear's just coming right at you, you know, and that's funny. <laughs> I got the picture. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> with the you think I would have just kicked him off, you know, like yeah. you could run faster without the doggone things, but I'm trying to keep them on in my dream, you know, like stay on my feet, run. <laughs> and then the whole time, flip, 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 flip. Yeah. I love it. Okay, today, my friend, we, oh, I can't believe this. We are in the book of Jude. And that means we only have this book and Revelation to go. And we have hit all 66 books of the Bible in our Bible survey series where we're taking a 10,000 foot view in the air and just kind of getting, um, you know, getting our bearings, checking out the lay of the land, if you will, uh, what mm. the Bible contains. Jude is one of these amazing books because it's twice as long as Third John, which <laughs> that's my joke. Because twice as long. Twice we as still long. may only have time for one chapter. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there is only one chapter. Yeah, yes. which makes that's, it really that's a good easy. Joke, yeah. yeah, see, we're just all full of the funnies. And maybe now you're like, okay, stop it. <laughs> and that's okay. Uh, this is going to be fun. I love when we approach these smaller books because we have a chance to then dig a little bit deeper than 10,000 feet in the air. And so please, my friend, it's really easy to read. We're going to go to some music. You can buzz through it real fast and then come up with all your questions for Pastor or Matthew. Answers. Or <laughs> answers. answers for us. We'll ask the questions and you give us there the answers. 855-539-4583. 855-KEY-GLUE is our text line. Let us know what you're thinking. Key Radio, Life Unlocked, Truth Unleashed, Open Up the Heavens, and God does, and He has, and, and will continue to. He's a good God. He's a loving God. And each and every day, we should look at it as a gift from Him, each moment. And it's hard to do sometimes, but, but <laughs> it is good. And uh, appreciate every moment that He gives you in life. Uh, we have the pleasure of having Matthew Anderson, Pastor Matthew Anderson of of um, Utah, Utah Valley, Valley Church. Church. I always... In Spanish Fork. <laughs> Ole. <laughs> I don't I know. you say that. <laughs> <laughs> and in the studio with us also is his beautiful wife, Shadra. I'm so glad that you're here. <laughs> we didn't give her a microphone yet, yeah, but maybe, yeah. maybe later. Yeah. She's she's shaking her head. No. <laughs> no. But that's okay, maybe. But... I, no, I think when, when the, we had them on like a long time ago. So two years ago, probably. Three, yeah. More than that. Even. Oh. When did you guys come out? <laughs> it's been what four or five years stop mm -hmm. you're aging us mike <laughs> knock it off yeah but, that was a lot yeah. of fun but i think chandra did more talking than matthew at, at the time she did not <laughs> <laughs> okay well we've had a lot of talking to do right now and digging into god's word and purposefully too and before we begin i just want to review 
first, second, third John, and just um, really reminding ourselves what those were about. They were very short books. They're like little postcards, if you will. Uh, John, first John was about fellowship, right? Just fellowship with, with believers. Uh, second John was about avoiding false teachers. And we've heard that many times, like in Second Peter mm-hmm. also, yep. against false teachers. So this is, you hear it once from the Lord and you're like, okay, this is, this is pretty important. When he says it twice, uh, then you're like, huh, uh, perhaps I should stop what I'm doing and listen. And now today we're going to be talking about contending for the faith, but there's also a warning about false mm-hmm. teachers. Uh, so now this is, and just these short little days that we've had, there's three really big, huge warnings, and actually more than that, about worrying about false teachers. Pay attention. God is trying to tell us something. Satan doesn't like you at all. Okay. (laughs) He wants to trip you up. He wants to confuse you. And God has given us the resources to be very, like to have great knowledge, great understanding about what he wants us to know. Is that right? Resources. What what are our resources to stay on track? Well, we're reading one of them (laughs) as we speak. Mm -hmm. We read one of them as we speak. And obviously, as uh, those who have faith in Jesus, we have the guidance of the indwelling Holy Spirit on our lives, in addition to the Word and uh, the fellowship of those who uh, are also contenders for the faith. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's kind of like, think about it in terms, like, I, I think contender, I think, you know, like, like somebody in the military, or even if you're a the football person ring. or a boxing yeah. ring. A yeah. I could have been a contender. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. And, and that's, Did I say that right, Grant? Yeah. You're giving me the look. Uh, we, yeah, we're all giving yeah. you looks, it's, Mike. It's, we're all rolling our eyes. That's good. Good <laughs> job. Uh, but we need we need to be vigilant. You know, we need to be those people who are watching. And when when somebody says something, I, I always feel like I need to have a buzzer or something. And when you hear something wrong, usually coming out of my own mouth, you know, it's like heresy. You know, because we want to make sure uh, that we understand God properly. He has revealed himself to us. This is tremendous mm. that our God wants us to know who he is and not just this, this knowledge like, OK, I know because I've read this book, but to actually have an intimate knowledge, a relationship knowledge with the Lord. Huge. Uh, mm. But you can have a relationship with people based on lies and untruths, and that's not a relationship at all. You need to have a relationship built on truth. And that's what God is asking us to do in the book of Jude. Am I right? You're right. OK, so let's talk about it. Yeah, yeah, let's do that. Who is this guy, Jude, to start with? And why is the letter titled Jude? Well, like most, like many of the epistles, the the letter's titled either by the audience to whom it was written for or by the author itself. And in this particular example, um, it's titled by the person who actually penned the the letter. Okay. And uh, the fellow's name was Jude, also known as Judas in, in some settings, or Judah, so those are all, um, like all the same, yeah, all the same okay. name, okay. right, right. And he uh, identifies himself in the very beginning in verse one. He says, "Jude, a servant of Christ Jesus and brother of James." Then he says, "Who he, he's writing to?" He says, "To all who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Christ or for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you." I love the way that he says that. May mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. So no, don't just have a measure of it, but have a, a multiplied measure of these good things. You beloved people, loved of God. <laughs> I just love that because it's so it's so kind and warm and gentle. But then he comes back with like uh, some challenging um, rebuke later on in 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 the in the text here. Um, but he identifies himself as a brother of James. And uh, what we are able to know through uh, through history and through scholarly research that this is the James who would have been uh, probably like the uh, the leader of the church in Jerusalem. He was the guy that wrote the the book of James. Right. Okay. <clears throat> and half uh, brother of Jesus, right? And, and that, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. He's so so this would make him the brother of Jesus. What I love about this is uh, here's James and Jude, mm-hmm. brothers of Jesus. And when you read the Gospels, these guys were unbelievers during uh, Jesus's uh, lifetime and ministry. Mm-hmm. They rejected uh, the lordship of Jesus uh, while Jesus was alive, but after the resurrection, his very brothers who mocked him for uh, claiming to be who he was, bowed their knee to him, and here's his own brother identifying as a servant 
of his brother. <laughs> I love that. Right? There's there's a great humility here um, because he recognizes that, you know, my my big brother Jesus. Wow, he's actually God, and and that changes everything. And right. so he identifies as being a bond servant, and then he does that relationship thing with his other brother James. I I, I love that. Like that is, isn't that. You hear about Jesus as an unbeliever. You know, you might even hear people use his name in vain, and it's not a big deal. But when you real, when you're confronted with Jesus, Lord and Savior, God of all creation, that drives you to your knees. All of a sudden, you're like, "Wow, mm. I am nothing. He is everything. I I want to be his bond servant." I, that is the proper response, right? Because I'm just, you know. <laughs> I'm just not going to treat my brothers that way. No, 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 no. You know? <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, Looking at the book of, of Jude, it is a shorter book, as we mentioned. It's uh, one chapter, and w- with the content, it's hard to date a little bit. So unlike a lot of the books where, okay, we could say this is 66 AD, this one they they rate from 70 to 80 AD. So it, it's a rather late book. Mm-hmm. And so regardless looking at that time frame, this is a time period when the early Christians were meeting some heavy persecution. Uh, so keep keeping that in mind as well. Mm-hmm. And I'm seeing, I'm seeing mid sixties here, Mike. Are you? Yeah. Isn't yeah. that interesting? So, says. so yeah, we got a wide range here. Yeah. Okay. But either way, that's, that's really not a long period of time it in isn't. between. So, um, okay. So 30 to 50 years after the resurrection during yeah. that time frame. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's huge. So this is supposed to be a letter, um, to, and it's to believers. Is that right? That's the context here. Okay. And, and it's also apparent that the majority of the audience that this was written to would likely have been of Jewish descent or Jewish background because mm-hmm. of the language and, and some of the illustrations that he uses, he uses things that would be familiar with Jewish people. So, you know, assuming that the majority of the audience like was probably Jewish, Sa- but Sodom, Gomorrah, of Jewish background, right? and uh, uh, Korah, and there's that even sort of mention thing. of Enoch as well. I think, mm-hmm. so, right? Yeah. yeah. So, okay. Well, wonderful. So, now, what is the purpose of the letter then? Well, it's it's really um, it's really a warning. Um, you know, if you look in your Bibles, the heading will often say false teachers. What's interesting about this uh, particular book is it doesn't really speak about any specific doctrine that anyone's teaching. Mm-hmm. But what it does address specifically is lifestyle that people are living. Okay. And it's, it's, um, it's really this appeal to understand the grace that you were saved by and to stay in that grace um, not mistreating it, not mis, not, you know, abusing it or abandoning uh, what real grace is. Mm-hmm. Hang on to that real grace that saved you. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, we see throughout the epistles, uh, there's two ways that we can um, essentially stray from grace because we're saved by grace through faith. This mm-hmm. is not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. And so there's two ways that we abandon and stray from grace. And we see this in the scriptures. And one way is through legalism. Okay. And that's adding additional laws or regulations uh, in order to earn something or earn God's favor. And we see this uh, in the book of Galatians. Right, right. People trying to go back to law and regulation in order to obtain or maintain God's favor. And then, and then the other side of that is licentiousness. It's like we're saved by grace. Therefore, I have this license to do whatever I want, license to sin, license to to uh, wild and, and lewd living. Because mm-hmm. uh, I got this get out of hell free card. Right, right. <laughs> That's just and so it's true. an absolute uh, abuse and a misunderstanding mm-hmm. of grace. And so w- what we struggle with as human beings is straying to one side or the other rather than resting in real grace. Mm. And, and I think the important part is, is to recognize that we have a changed heart and the desire to do those things as we are trusting in Christ or after we trust in Christ that new heart doesn't have room for some of these things. That, right. I mean, we shouldn't have those same desires that we had before to to <laughs> walk in uh, right. the ways of the world. Right. It's it's approaching um, it's appro- approaching the the grace of Jesus without a repentant heart. It's like, uh, yeah, I want a license to live crazy and wild, and that's a misunderstanding of the depth of the love of God. Sure. Yeah. 
Well, in, in living a crazy wild life, when we hear those words, we think, oh, so no fun? Is that what you're saying? And no, God has a has purpose for us. He's got wonderful purpose, great purpose, and, and abundant life uh, planned for us. But if we are living this licentious life where it's all about us, we're missing out on these great, incredible blessings that God wants to lavish on us. Uh, the other thing that I, I'm just kind of thinking of is we live the way that we believe. Right. So if we truly believe that Christ died for our sins and that our sins were so very costly, like it cost him his life and that my sin grieves the spirit so much, I don't want to live like that because I love my Lord. Right. And so I don't want to live grieving him. I want to live to please him because mm. we have that relationship. But if I don't have a relationship and I'm just going to kind of say, ah, eh, whatever, I want to I want to make sure that what I say I believe, I'm living that. It's kind of that whole walk the walk. You know, don't oh, just talk the talk, but you got to walk yeah, it too. And, and Jude really summarizes that in verse 4. He he says exactly what you're saying. He says, for certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Mm. So it's, it's really uh, people who want God's grace but they don't want Jesus to be king. Yeah, wow. Hey, you're listening to Mike and Heather in the morning on Key Radio with Pastor Matthew Anderson. We're going to go to some more music. There's This is time for questions, so go ahead and give us a text, 855-539-4583, and give us a text and give them your questions. Key Radio, Life Unlocked, Truth Unleashed. Hey. Woe, woe to them. Woe to them. Verse 11. Okay. Woe to them. Read it, Mike. Read it. We, woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain, and for pay they have rushed headlong into their the error of Balaam and perished in the rebellion of Korah. And if you are reading that and you're like, who's this Balaam? Who's this Korah? Who's this Cain? Guess what? <laughs> that is all in the Old Testament. So this is Old Testament scripture uh, that Jude is referring to. And and my friend, I think the idea here is that we need to be careful Um we need to be very careful in what we are, how we're living, and our understanding of who God is. That means we have to be good students of God's word. We need to understand what his attributes are, yes, but what he has done for us, that is what's important. That's what we start on because we know that we're sinners, right? And that goes Genesis 3. Oh, boy, that was, what, 65 books ago, right? <laughs> And and we need to understand that we need a saving. Jesus being a savior doesn't make any sense if you don't realize that we need saving. So you start right there. The fall. The fall was when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden. And from that time on, man has the sin nature. That means that we are not worthy to even be like speaking God's name, right? Because we are wretched sinners. But God being rich in mercy loves us so much that he sent his son Jesus to come to earth and he lived the perfect sinless life that we could never possibly walk because we've already sinned, right? Um, once you sin, you're a sinner. Actually, you're you're just a sinner, period. And, and Jesus was not. He was that perfect lamb. If you're looking back in Leviticus, right, there is a sacrificial system there. That was all a precursor, a, a shadow of what was to come. Jesus did not abolish that law that was placed back in, Le in Leviticus. He fulfilled it. He was the lamb that was slain. He was the one who shed blood for you and for me on our behalf so that he took on our sin and he gave us his righteousness. They call that the great exchange. I call that amazing. Just amazing. So when you are rooted in that relationship, that understanding of what God has done for you, all of a sudden, the just scripture opens up because you realize, wow, God is trying to connect with me. He's done all the work already. He's died for me. And now as I look in scripture, I see who he is and what he has in store for me. He wants my good. He wants me to, to live for him. There's great blessing in that. Oh, and it's good to be a child of God. So that's what we're kind of looking at. But there are people 
in Jude's time and actually just throughout history, and especially in our time today, where people are saying the weirdest things about God, things that are not true. One of the biggest things is all roads lead to heaven. What? (laughs) No, (laughs) that's not true. That's not true. The fact that God even gave us a way to be right with him is tremendous. And that was a tremendous thing. That was the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we start there. That is the first, that's the starting block of this race we call life. And my friend, if you don't know the Lord Jesus, if you haven't placed your full trust in him and what he has done for you, that he's paid the full price for your sin, you need to start there. And you just go to him and just tell him, Lord, I I receive your gift. I know there's nothing I can do because I'm a sinner already. I know that I'm condemned already, but you give me eternal life through Jesus. I want that. And there's nothing special in your words. It's all about your heart relationship with him. And then, my friend, you need to put on your seatbelt because then the Christian life is one ride that is just adventurous, to say the least. It is. Mm -hmm. It's a great life. (laughs) <laughs> it doesn't mean the life gets easier, but it always gets better. Mm. Yeah. Oh, that's good. That's yeah. good. W- walking in the joy and the, and the victory that he's given us. And that's just a neat thing that we can we can live in that. Regardless of what's spinning around us, the world is right. <laughs> it comes with its challenges and trials. Yep. But w- we have something that is, is above that, is beyond that. We just look and keep our eyes focused on the creator, the one that's given us life. And, you know, and God is good that way. And I really think that's what Jude is pointing to in this whole book. Mm -hmm. You know, he identifies himself as a servant of Jesus. And he says, hey, I'm writing to you who are also fellow believers. You know, we share the same faith. Remember that. I'm writing to you. But there are those who deny the lordship of Jesus. They deny Jesus as king. Mm -hmm. And I want to warn you about that. Because the very Jesus who came to save them, they are now rejecting by their own conduct and lifestyle. Yeah. They've turned a different way and uh, they've bailed out on Jesus. Hey, they're showing up like as though they are part of the family, but they're living a lifestyle that is totally contrary to someone who has been redeemed. Mm-hmm. How do we, as Christians, as believers, or in, and especially like if we're new to the, to walking the, the Christian walk, how do we contend for the faith? What things can we do so that we don't get pulled from one way or another and that we stay true to what our understanding is about Scripture and how can we grow in the Lord? Just practical things. How can we do that? Well, <clears throat> you know that it's uh, we, we live in the flesh. Yeah. So we have these, these uh, fleshly desires, and it's always a challenge for us to figure out how to um, how to live with those fleshly desires in a way that honors God. And, uh, and his word is very clear on that. It doesn't mean that it makes it easy, mm-hmm. but his word's clear. And the more familiar we are with his word, the more familiar we are with the heart of God. And we've been talking about this church at church lately that, uh, you know, who can, who can understand the mind of God? Like we are his creation and we are finite in our, in our abilities in every way. And yet we, we serve a creator who's infinite in power, authority, wisdom, and might. In every way, he's infinite. And uh, who are we to try to, to discern the thoughts of God, the mind of God? It's, it's impossible for us. But what is fantastic about our creator is that he has a heart that he reveals to us. And through a relationship with him, through prayer, through time and his word together with him, not of obligatory kind of a thing, but as a, as a real authentic relationship with him, we, we can begin to know the heart of God. And the more that we know about the heart of God, God's heart, the more he changes our heart. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's an amazing thing. And so really, you know, you become like those who you spend time with. Right, right. So spend time with the Lord is what you're saying. Preach it, girl. That's what you're saying. I well, like it. Yeah, that's why you're here. You're supposed to be preaching. It. Yeah, but, and he's, he's given us this word to stay on the the narrow. Of uh, there, there's so many crazy ideas out there about God. I mean, just go out to the internet and start looking, right? Mm-hmm. And you could end up in all kinds of crazy directions. People like pulling a script, a, a verse out of the Bible, and creating entire doctrines from it, separate from the whole Word of God. And so there's a lot of things we got to be cautious about. Well, he's given us his word to know him. Mm-hmm. And as we spend time with him, we spend time in his word. We grow in that relationship. And, and I love what you guys have done here in this series, going from Genesis to Revelation and 
really taking in the full counsel of the Word of God. That's really important so that we don't get lopsided in our theology. Not that not that Scripture contradicts itself, because it doesn't, but uh, Scripture explains itself mm-hmm. when you take it, you know, you take the whole bite of it, mm-hmm. you know. And uh, so that's why I love you guys doing this whole series all the way through, getting us engaged in all of God's Word and uh, helping us to understand it from, you know, from a complete and balanced perspective. It's so good. (laughs) It's been a real trip. You know, and what we're talking about here, you can look at verse 20 here in Jude. uh, It says, but you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. And have mercy on some who are doubting, save others, snatching them out of the fire. These are all things that are helping each other out. These are relationship Mm -hmm. words. We do not walk this Christian faith alone. Um, Definitely, we've got the Bible. We need to be good students. Yes, we need to be spending time with the Lord, talking to him and listening to what he has to say. But also, we need to be surrounding ourselves with fellow believers. And many times... Uh, the best thing, like especially for new believers, go find somebody who's been walking with the Lord for a number of years and, and, and glean information and knowledge and wisdom from them. They've learned a lot, and, and <laughs> it's amazing the things that they can mm-hmm. teach us. Always going back, though, always going back. If somebody says something to you, tell me, where can I find that in Scripture? Remembering the Bible is our prime authority because the Bible is God's revealed word to us. Um, is there any other things that a new believer should know about? Or if you talk to a, a person who's said, you know what, I just placed my faith in Jesus. Where do I start? Is there anything else that you would tell them that they should do uh, to help them in their walk and starting out? A, do they know any other Christians? Mm-hmm. And I would say seek uh, seek Christian fellowship. She, seek some connection with, uh, with other believers. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, Jesus called us to a, a lifestyle of being discipled. In fact, that was the Great Commission to go and make disciples the way Jesus made disciples. And so his his design for the Christian faith is for us to be nurtured when we're new in our faith as infants, as new believers, to be nurtured by those who are who are uh, more mature in the faith. And maturity isn't always a one for one parallel with biblical information. It usually coincides with maturity, but maturity is typically a lifestyle. What we see here in this in in Jude here are some guys who consider themselves teachers whose lifestyle is not consistent mm. with the Word of God. Mm-hmm. And uh, as human beings, we learn best through modeling. You know, we can take on information. Um, you can tell me how to love my wife, and I can hear that information, and I can even read it in the Bible. But when I see Mike love his wife, mm-hmm. and I see what that looks like. It makes sense in such a tangible way that I can imitate that. And that's coming from verse 12 and 13. These are men who are hidden reefs in your love feasts when they feast with you without fear, caring for themselves, clouds without water, carried along by winds, autumn trees without fruit, doubly dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea, casting up their own shame like foam wandering stars for whom the black darkness (laughs) <laughs> has been reserved Jude forever. is quite the poet here. Huh? <laughs> right? yeah. He's got a few, he's got a few uh, highly selected words to describe these people. Like. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I'm going to have to memorize that one. And there's judgment for these people as we go yeah, on in that passage. There is. Yeah. But what I love about Jude is even though he's, he's not, I mean, he's just straightforward and, and very descript about what these people are like who consider themselves shepherds or teachers, but they're living a lifestyle inconsistent with real faith in Jesus. And and then you look down and he talks about even how to treat them. He says to show mercy with fear to them. Okay, so you can hate even the garments that are polluted by the flesh, but we're to be merciful even in the way that we treat these people uh, that are living so in, willfully inconsistent mm-hmm. with the kingship of Jesus. And the one way to do that, living mercifully with them is... We pray for them, right? Yeah, and right? Because we don't want to gossip. We don't want to go to people and say, oh, 
have you seen what John's been doing? Blah, blah, blah. I mean, okay, that's just breeding more sin, and we don't need that. But definitely the first thing we need to be doing is <laughs> running to the Lord and saying, hey, Dad, Dad, this thing has happened to the, to, you know, and that's what we need to be doing and, and seeking good counsel and then following through on that and prayerfully going before that person and, and talking to them. And then having, if that person's not listening, bring another person who is is trustworthy and, and talking to them and praying for them and praying with with them. Uh, and then, you know, if they're not responding, then you know what you do? You you, t- you tell them about what Jesus has done for them again and go from square one. We need to be reminded daily of what Jesus has mm-hmm. done for us. We, all of us humans so, do. So you're, you're actually quoting what Jesus said to do and how to treat people who are living in, in lives, living lives inconsistent with the kingship of Jesus. Matthew 18. And it's right. Is it, is it Matthew 18 or? Yeah. Yeah. I think so, yeah. What are the what are the verses there? I'm not there right now. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we can go there another time. Because that's, yeah, no, it's because we're in Jude. We are in Jude. <laughs> we are in Jude. But the, it all it all connects together, though. It does. The whole Bible works together. Mm-hmm. It it's a beautiful thing how it all does. It weaves together, and uh, that's why I appreciate you guys going through this whole uh, mm. the whole whole book of the Bible together. Well, we are, and, and let's just. This is part two, is uh, 24, okay, in Jude 24, it says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with the, with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. Do you see the heart of Jude here? Yeah. Wow, you talk about praising your Creator, your Lord, your Savior. That's probably one of the coolest doxologies in in all of the Bible. I think it's just so beautiful. Oh man, man, it's so good. And and I I just gravitate on that. He is able to keep you from stumbling. The Lord doesn't just sit there and say, "Okay, here's my word," and you've got your friends over there, and okay, go. He doesn't do that. He is with you. He it, the, do we say relationship enough here? I hope that it's sinking. And mm, this yeah. is and, not religion. And this reminds me to like Galatians 5, where we're walking in the spirit and we're not committing the lust of the flesh. Uh, it, it, we're, when we're having that relationship, when we're walking in that spirit mm-hmm. and, and not you know, doing what we want to do, he is able to keep us from stumbling. Yeah. And, you know, and there's, there's before that, and have mercy on some who are doubting. Just to back up a little bit, you were talking about the, the, the importance of fellowship with believers, having people around you. It seems like we go on these cycles, all of us do, where our faith goes stronger and goes up and down a little bit. And we want those, the, the wavelength and, and the wave depth to, to go away over time as we mature. And if we have people around us who are, are walking with the Lord, people who are strong in their faith and encouraging us and, and we encourage them uh, th- there's an important part. There's a leveling thing that goes on there as mm-hmm. we help each other go through those periods. Mm-hmm. And what I love about that is it also the the Word of God frees us to be honest about our doubts. Mm-hmm. And that's what I love about it. In so many other faith structures, it's like you're not allowed to even think about your doubts. Uh, but the Bible gives us freedom to to have question and pursue answers for those things and to be real and honest. And we get the the freedom to be uh, to loving, be loving and merciful towards those who do have questions and doubts, mm-hmm. not to condemn or cast out, but to to gracefully uh, walk with them and help them find answers. Yeah, and to speak life into their lives, Amen. right? I mean, we don't need to pull each other down. We don't Amen. need to be condemning if somebody says, "Ah, oh, I got a question." No, embrace them, That's love right. them, speak life into them. Oh, That's so right. good, so good. Okay, my friend, this has been. The book of Jude. Do we have any concluding remarks? Well, I don't have a concluding remark, but I do have something really fascinating that I just love from the book of Jude. And um, it it comes from verse five. It says, now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus who saved a people out of the land of Egypt afterward destroyed those who did not believe. Mm. And I don't want to emphasize so much on the destruction part, but but the, the cool thing is this, that the Jesus who was saving people back in the Old Testament, <laughs> is still saving people today. 
Jesus is throughout the entire Bible. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> it's a book <laughs> of redemption. So good. Oh, wow. Okay. Utah Valley Church, you have special Easter uh, goings on? We don't have anything that's out of the ordinary, but we do have an Easter service because this is the hallmark of the Christian faith. Easter is. It's like the holiday of holidays for those of us who have been saved by Jesus. Amen. And so we will have a very celebratory uh, service, but service starts at the same time, 1030. Okay. And on Sunday morning. Located where? Uh, we're at... Uh, 165 North Main in Spanish Fork at the Angelus Theater. Fantastic. Thank you for leading our conversation, Chandra. It was so good to have you here. And thank you for listening as well. This has been Mike and Heather in the Morning, a production of Key Radio, located in beautiful Provo, Utah. For more information about the program and the ministries of Key Radio, check out our website, keyradio.org. On behalf of Mike, Heather, and the entire Key Radio staff, have a blessed and glorious day.